This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great platform that makes it easy and simple for you to buy, hold, and sell and earn crypto. You can trade from anything to anything. For example, you can trade between cryptocurrencies and precious metals. It's an amazing platform that I've been using for years. And in fact, I still use to this day because they're one, a great exchange, um, they're reputable, and they're one of the only exchanges that still lists XRP. Many Many of the other exchanges have delisted XRP due to the SEC lawsuit, but you can still get XRP on Uphold. So I have interviewed the CEO, the founder, and many other representatives from Uphold over the years, and I'm a fan of this platform. And once again, there's some great features like trading between different assets very easily. You don't have to convert to a currency and so forth. They're used by 10 plus million users. They have over 200 cryptocurrencies. And they have a very easy to use app. Uh, the interface is really nice. So I can certainly vouch for this platform. Once again, I've been a user for years. So if you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Congressman Tom Emmer. Congressman Emmer, it's great to have you back on the show. Great to be with you, man. Well, Congressman, the last time we spoke was back in January of this year, and a lot has happened and, and progressed in the crypto market. But I want to get a pulse from your perspective. Um, how do you feel the United States is doing as it relates to progress with crypto regulations? I, I, again, I, I don't think we're doing well at all. Uh, again, I just uh, we've got, what is it, uh, 28 days between now and the end of the year, legislative days. Uh, I do expect things are going to change dramatically, Tony. I think, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, when you talk about the regulators under the Biden administration, uh, I've been very disappointed. I, and by the way, Tony, anybody who's ever heard you and I talk in the past, uh, it, I'm not partisan when it comes to this. I was not uh, uh, overly thrilled with the uh, Trump uh, administration's uh, regulators. Uh, when it came to uh, their interaction with crypto. But I think it's in an area that I think you and I talked about previously, where I thought the new administration would give us a breath of fresh air and start looking at this uh, much differently. I, it's actually, in my opinion, gotten worse. So uh, we have to ride this through. Uh, the market obviously has given them the ability to say, see, we told you so. Sure. Uh, but they're not, they're not doing the things they need to do, Tony. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, Voyager. Mm. Voyager has uh, recently, uh, you know, uh, had some uh, significant problems. People have lost uh, a lot of money. Uh, and the uh, administration is now complaining uh, that the uh, the bank here in this country that was banking them uh, made the mistake of allowing their uh, their customers to believe that they were FDIC insured. Mm. Right. Well, Here's the problem. Uh, that had been out there. I, I think I, my staff had shown me that as early as December of 2019, uh, Voyager was uh, advertising that uh, they were FDIC insured. Uh, Tony, where were the regulators back in 2019? All you had to do was a Google search. Sure. You know, all sure. you do have to do is have a notification. Where were they? Uh, and I, I think this is the issue right now. Our regulators uh, do need more clarity, right? And I've said this from day one. We, Congress has to do its job. We got to lay out for them what actually in the digital asset space constitutes cash, what constitutes a commodity, what constitutes a security. And then we have to hold them accountable that they're actually staying within their lane. That's a, a, a failure on both the congressional side, the legislative side, and the regulator side. But the idea that the regulators right now under the Biden administration, they can complain about the wild, wild west, as they call it, of uh, the crypto uh, community. In fact, it's the, the uh, Biden regulators that are the wild, wild west. They're, uh, they're all over the place. And I, you know, you know, uh, and it's well publicized that I've been very critical of Gary Gensler and the SEC as an example. When you have their enforcement division sending out sweep letters to the crypto community, mm -hmm. uh, by the way, and beyond, uh, that they admit 
are outside of their jurisdiction and then making their lives miserable when they don't provide the information that they're that they want. Uh, this is the wild, wild west of regulation. Hmm. Yeah. You know, there's there was a lot that took place throughout the year. Um, we had the Biden uh, crypto executive order. Um, do you think that's going to yield any good results? Is it potentially going to you know rein in these regulators to be on the same page or we're not really sure about that? Well, I, I think it's the latter. Uh, you're not really sure, but you started out with this, this, will this yield good results? Just the fact that the Biden administration, uh, the president and his executive order, uh, the working group, that they were uh, willing to take that step. I think that's good news, Tony. Mm. I mean, whenever you're raising, it's kind of like uh, Senators uh, Lummis and uh, Gillibrand, you know, they, they had this intellectual property that they held so close and it was going to be this big rollout. Uh, at the end of the day, they they did have some interesting stuff in there, but they also had a whole bunch of, uh, which we're very proud of, uh, House uh, bills that were stitched together as this uh, this proposal on the Senate side. That was great, because if you think about it, they raised the profile, and we've got to be talking about this. You know, the administration and others, uh, the naysayers within the administration, because we also have champions in the administration, sure. uh, they uh, they are putting up obstacles when, look, this is going to happen with or without us. In other words, the evolution of digital assets and how people uh, do business together and trade value for value. Uh, and it can either happen here in the United States or it's going to go elsewhere. And I think uh, every time, whether it's uh, a member of the Biden administration, the president himself, uh, whether it's uh, senators uh, who are putting out, you know, uh, the big press uh, events and then going around and selling it, or it's on our side where, uh, you know, those of us that have been pushing this for years are working with our ranking member, uh, Patrick McHenry, to uh, get ready for the next Congress. Uh, I think all of these are important and they're good news. For sure. Um, you know, I've, I've been very happy to see the bipartisan support, Democrats and Republicans working together. Um, and my question for you is, we've seen a, a good amount of folks come together. Is there a need for more for us to actually get things to put be pushed through via Congress? Yeah, I mean, remember, you've got the House, the Senate and the uh, the executive branch, the uh, executive himself, the president. Uh, you got to have all three. But I think uh, it is up to us because I can complain all the time about the bureaucrats, about the uh, regulators that I believe are, uh, like I said, acting like the wild, wild west and just going out and doing whatever their, you know, their power uh, they believe allows them to do because we're not holding them accountable. Uh, and I would argue right now it would be my Democrat colleagues in the House and the Senate the very people who are responsible for confirming these regulators uh, have not been holding them accountable. But that being said, uh, you already, you and I already have plenty of friends on both the House side and the Senate side, on both the Republican side of the aisle and the Democrat side of the aisle that uh, are not only interested in digital assets and digital asset policy, but are uh, advocating for policy. So. I think it's part of the evolution, Tony. Mm. Uh, do we need more? You always need more uh, to, to answer your question. That's why we have, have the, uh, the bipartisan uh, blockchain caucus in the House, which is the, uh, the go-to organization uh, in Congress for all things digital. And I, I, uh, I would argue that the, just the growth of that uh, caucus shows you uh, where we're headed. But we always need more and we always welcome more people because this area has nothing to do with being a Republican or a Democrat. And sure. that's what people have to remember. Now, something recently happened with the U.S. Treasury sanctioning Tornado Cash, which is a crypto mixer platform. And uh, it kind of opened up a, a, a Pandora's box a bit because they took an approach which folks were not happy with, and that is sanctioning the code versus the, the nefarious actors, the people who are using the, the platform for wrong things. What are your thoughts on that? And, and and maybe this is part of the larger question of we need to get all of these government agencies and branches on the same page on how we want to uh, regulate this market. 
No, that actually, it's a great point. But your your initial point is the key, right? When it comes to uh, tornado cash, the difference the difference between this and other action. First, why don't I start with the fact that uh, OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset and Control, within the uh, the, the Treasury Department, uh, they're the ones responsible for this. And we have to remember that their job, their priority is protecting uh, the United States national security. Sure. So it, it, as I start to answer your question, Tony, I'm not going to suggest that OFAC did not have the authority to do what they did with tornado cash. I just don't know yet. Right. But you point out the most important thing. Normally, what OFAC does is sanction people, persons or entities. In this case, Tornado Cash is a decentralized software that's built on Ethereum that allows users to privately send funds on the blockchain using smart contracted Ethereum wallets that accept funds. It mixes them around, like you said, and kicks them out, sending the funds to the intended recipients. So it's unclear who's sending the funds to whom. The software, again, as you pointed out, is controlled by code not by any person or entity, right? I, the idea is it's great if, uh, for instance, employers who pay their employees in crypto, but they don't want their team to know how much everyone makes, uh, this, this could be very useful, right? But it also uh, potentially could be used by money launderers. Uh, and obviously, in this case, it's been proven to be used by North Korea in the uh, the recent uh, Axi Infinity uh, uh, in the the nom nomad hack, so mm -hmm. I mean, you got to keep the national security uh, issues in mind. But uh, it's it, we got to find out: Does OFAC believe the sanctioned addresses are controlled by people and not code? Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's the case, what does this mean for privacy rights and innovation? And there's another place that I think people better start looking at uh, in our country, which is. Uh, you probably saw it, but the Dutch uh, recently arrested one of the developers of Tornado Cash, and they're 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 the Dutch are actually asserting that developing technology that's intended to be used by criminals is a crime in itself. Hmm. Of course, uh, it's this would be extremely concerning because they're the developers are merely intent on developing privacy enabling technology, so. That's a big concern and it's something that we should be watching. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about this how, how and how the governments are going to find that balance between, um, you know, allowing innovation and maintaining certain levels of rights of privacy, but also, uh, look, we have to stop the, the people who are looking to do bad things, right? Um, so I, 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 I don't know how that's going to happen. And maybe it's a lot of conversations and a lot of research and education. Um, but it's such a tricky situation. And, and I, I'm, wo I'm wondering what's going to happen to some of the pri privacy coins as well, like Monero and Zcash and so forth. Well, I mean, that's why I said this is going to be uh, big. Mm -hmm. Congress needs to do its job. We need to find out how OFAC is looking at this, because as you and I talk about it, Tornado cash was supposed to be done based on code, not a person. Right. Right. And, and you're not supposed to be able to identify that. If, in fact, you can, well, then it's not what we thought it was. And I think uh, then we got to have some deeper conversations. But when it comes to this privacy issue, it's one of the reasons that I'm so opposed to a central bank digital currency, because that to me is just a, a, a potential tracking device that can be used for bad things by the central authority. I look, we have to be able to maintain our privacy. Yeah. I, I, I am one of those people, I'm going to say it over and over again, because I will always fall on the individual rights, privacy rights side of the ledger. Uh, I do not believe that it's worth it for me to give up all my privacy to quote unquote, be safe, because I might have just given up all my privacy to people who, uh, while they're telling me they're the ones that are going to keep me safe. They're actually the ones that are going to keep uh, me under their thumb. And I, you know, that's the balance. And as a policymaker, yeah, we got to make sure that the bad guys, the, the good guys have the tools to get the bad guys, but not at the expense of the good guys. Absolutely. Uh, well, I absolutely <laughs> agree with you on that. And um, do you have 
by any chance, and and you may not, but you know when we may see that digital dollar, even though you know I think we're both not fans of it, and and we want to make sure it maintains the right to privacy, uh, reflecting the Constitution. Well, I, I mean, it's funny that you ask that right now because uh, there have been ongoing discussions on the House side between our ranking member on the Financial Services Committee, Patrick McHenry and his team and the uh, chair of the Financial Services uh, Committee, uh, Maxine Waters, in regard to stablecoin legislation, right? Mm -hmm. But what the Democrat uh, chair wants in return for some reasonable uh, stablecoin legislation, she wants a central bank digital currency. Uh, And I just, uh, you know, I I don't, that's that's a no-go, obviously, for many of us. I I think uh, uh, ranking member McHenry was trying to get them to a study. I don't even like that. Uh, But, you know, if you can get some uh, reasonable legislation on the stablecoin side, we're not in charge right now. Uh, If if you could do that without actually uh, enabling a CBDC, perhaps it's something to talk about. But, Tony, uh, the reality is we have uh, 11 legislative days left before the midterms and only 28 legislative days left in the year. So I think we're really talking about something that's going to be a 2023 uh, next Congress uh, thing. And I think you're going to see uh, uh, some significant crypto legislation move uh, next year. So I wanted to get your thoughts on the balance between potential CBDC and stable coins. Would your ideal scenario be we use one of the stable coins that already exists in the market, like USDC, which is pegged to the US dollar, um, is is backed by a regulated firm such as Circle versus the United States government launching the central bank digital currency. Is that kind of your ideal scenario or something different? No, no, no. I'm with Tony, uh, and I'm assuming, based on uh, our relationship and how I've gotten to know you, that you would agree with me that mm-hmm. the way you uh, that you posed it, that's where I would start from. I think this is not something that uh, requires the, the federal government to absorb it. I, I think uh, legislation, and I'm going to talk in very general terms, so anybody listening to this, no, I, we we aren't working on the details. I know that. Uh, and I, I hope I can say some of this. I think uh, some of the framework for stable coin issuance uh, that it was being discussed uh, between uh, our ranking member and uh, the chairwoman on the committee would allow for insured uh, depository institutions, banks to issue stable coins, and it would force uh, non-bank uh, stable coin issuers to be regulated by the Fed. Uh, but to your bigger uh, issue, yeah, I think it should be done on the private side. I think we give those guidelines and we allow those the stable coin uh, to be a, uh, a private uh, stable coin that is backed up appropriately by uh, assets that, uh, you know, whether it's the U.S. dollar or and or uh, other um, uh, uh, things, uh, that's where I'm at as opposed to turning it over to uh, the Federal Reserve and or the Treasury and allowing them to create accounts and start to monitor uh, uh, purchases and behavior of the American public or anyone who's using that central bank digital currency. Quite frankly, uh, all we need to do is look at the the digital yuan to know uh, how that gets used. And it's not good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Congressman... (coughs) I, me. I, I pause a bit as I'm going to go to this next topic because it makes me very upset. And, and I and I often think about this is where my tax dollars are going, and that is the SEC. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I want to talk a bit about the midterm elections. It looks like Republicans are going to win. What does that mean for the oversight of the SEC? Well, it's going to change dramatically, as I as I said earlier. Uh, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, even though crypto, uh, to me, and the, the entire area of digital assets is not a Republican or a Democrat thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't care if you're uh, uh, my uh, uh, colleague from California, uh, Representative Kana, who uh, he and I, if you put us on a uh, 
uh, on a, uh, a continuum of, uh, you know, here's the far right, here's the far left. He and I would not match up at all when it comes to our policy perspectives of what government should be and what it should be doing. Uh, when it comes to this issue, I, it's not about his political perspective or Tom Emmer's. Uh, it's something totally different. Now, that being said, the Democrats are currently in charge of Congress. They are, uh, are the ones with the gavels and the subpoena authority, and they have not been holding bureaucrats like Gary Gensler uh, accountable mm. for, his, uh, for his behavior. So I, I think what you will see, uh, assuming that uh, what we're seeing is accurate, that there will be a new day coming and that Republicans will take back control of the House and perhaps uh, the Senate as well, you will see aggressive congressional oversight uh, because that's only going to strengthen our system of government, right? Uh, bureaucrats like Gary Gensler do not make the laws. Mm. Unelected bureaucrats, regulators don't get to politicize the rules of the road or hold the keys to opportunity. And but assuming Republicans win the House uh, in the midterms in November, we will then have the subpoena power, which will force the SEC and Gary Gensler to comply with the crest requests in our letters. And we've sent several of them already, yeah. already, and it will give us the tools to hold him accountable. A more yeah. aggressive oversight of our regulators will keep Biden's uh, regulators in check to ensure they're working toward a stronger, better future for the United States. One that's actually filled with more opportunities for Americans, not fewer, which unfortunately, Tony, I think the behavior of Gary Gensler and some others, uh, Rohit uh, Chopra, I'm going to call him, uh, and others, uh, are, uh, uh, the guy at the FDIC, they've been limiting opportunities, especially in this fastest growing area, uh, exciting area uh, involving digital assets. Now, Congressman Emmer, th there have been some information that has been released via FOIA requests from... Um, Empower Oversight, which is a nonprofit whistleblower organization, and even through the Ripple lawsuit <clears throat> around Ethereum and ethics violations, potential conflicts of interest with uh, specifically Bill Hinman, who is no longer the SEC. And I don't want to say potential, you know, because uh, none of these things have been uh, formally confirmed and so forth. Um, and this has caused people to lose confidence in the SEC. And I, I don't know if you've seen it on social media, but there's hundreds of thousands of people uh, very upset and it's just getting kind of toxic. And some are asking, or they wanted me to ask you, can you call for an investigation into such uh, uh, you know, potential conflicts of interest? And how do, how do we get the SEC to you know, restore the confidence back in, in the public? Well, first off, I... You're touching the edges of this, which I really appreciate because uh, you didn't ask it directly. But the issues that you're talking about, right, uh, with the uh, with the Ripple lawsuit, because they're related, we really can't. We shouldn't. I, I suppose I could, but we should not comment on uh, you know the ongoing lawsuit. Uh, but I, I would say to you that uh, going back to what I brought up. The reality is right now, Biden's regulators are acting lawlessly because Democrats in Congress who hold the gavels will not exercise, exercise their oversight responsibility over the very regulators they confirm. Mm. And so I, I will just emphasize again, Tony, when Republicans take back the majority, nothing will stop us from fulfilling our responsibility to act as a check on the executive branch. And I told this to uh, uh, Gary Gensler's enforcement director, a new day is coming. Mm -hmm. So uh, those, those uh, listeners, those that you work with that are wondering what we'll do, that's about as, as direct as I want to get related to the specifics that you just brought up. Uh, we will be very aggressive in our oversight. And by the way, uh, making sure that we hold them accountable uh, once we uh, confirm what we know they're doing. That's why I refer to it as the wild west of, of regulators, the wild, wild west of regulation. Um, I appreciate that clarity because I think even myself, I didn't understand the dynamic. And that is while yourself and, and other members like Warren Davidson and so forth can ask questions and bring certain topics up, 
the enforcement, to your point, is on the, the Demo- your Democratic colleagues who right. are not actually t- doing anything. <laughs> no, not right now. And I, I mean, I, I feel for them because uh, we've got several who will go unnamed, right? Well, you could go look at our the letter that's called the Blockchain 8, right? It'll show you a letter that we sent to Gary Gensler uh, several months ago. Uh, talking about his uh, his sweep letters uh, in so many words, what they're doing, why they're doing it, uh, which he did respond to, but he didn't answer. I mean, we've got friends on the other side. Again, this is not about being a Republican or a Democrat, but I think they're frankly being stonewalled by their speaker mm-hmm. and by their, uh, their chairwoman that uh, they just don't feel that they can do anything right now. And I'm sure that they're looking if I were sitting on their side of the aisle, they're looking at November and the end of the year and saying, you know what, this is important stuff. I think it's more important that we not screw it up and that uh, if we have to get to the next Congress, when we can work with our uh, Republican colleagues to get something done, that's what we're going to do. So, uh, no, they're not doing their job. I, I'm not going to blame them, speci- you know, the uh, those friends that we have uh, on this topic, digital assets, uh, but... I, I think they are looking to the next, uh, the new day that's coming as well. Got it. Um, so final question here. I'm curious, uh, what's on your agenda for, I know you did, you outlined quite a few things, but um, the crypto regulations, maybe hearings and things like that for the remainder of the year. Uh, I know we don't have much time left, you know, as far as like, you know, get Congress being able to do much, but uh, anything you want to highlight? Well, it would be that stable coin stuff that we talked about earlier. That's about the uh, that's about the the most important thing that you might see uh, that uh, gets done. I I don't know that it'll get done. That might be offered, right? I I know they've been working on it now for a couple of months. Uh, they thought they were close, uh, then it fell apart. I know they're uh, they're going to be working extremely hard over the next couple of weeks. We're going to come back. I think it's the twelfth of September uh, for that that short. Uh, 12 day, whatever it is before the uh, 11 or 12 legislative days before the uh, midterms. I just don't know that you're going to, uh, that you're going to see anything come out of that. But then for us, I mean, we're still going to be talking about regular, uh, regulatory clarity, right? The Securities Clarity Act, the Blockchain Regulatory Certainty Act, the Safe Harbor for Taxpayers with Forked Assets Act, uh, these types of things, we're going to continue to be uh, talking about them, whether or not we get legislation uh, through the committee before the end of the year. That's that's a big question. But get ready. Uh, strap on your helmet uh, starting in January of 2023, because I think uh, when it comes to digital assets, we're going to be in for quite a ride. I think uh, Republicans and Democrats will be ready to uh, throw those uh, those jerseys off, get on the same team and see if we can move some of this stuff. And then our biggest challenge at that point will be, uh, you know, Chair Gensler, uh, Director Grunberg, uh, Comptroller Sue, and uh, the CFPB Director, who's uh, frankly just been, uh, talk about a a wild cowboy. Uh, It'll be holding them accountable uh, and making sure that the uh, that the president understands how significant this is to our economy and our future, uh, so that we can get some of these things passed into law. Congressman Emmer, always a pleasure, sir. Uh, thank you, and uh, uh, you know we'll we'll definitely talk more as things progress. I look forward to it, Tony. Thank you.